Welcome to Wild Linalge, which is a online video course in linear algebra. I'm Norman Wahlberger. I'm an associate professor at the University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia, in the School of Mathematics and Statistics. I've posted a few other things online in YouTube, a series called Wild Trig, which deals with rational trigonometry and many aspects of geometry and also another series called Math Foundations where I talk about foundations of mathematics. My username on YouTube is NJ Wildberger and here is my web pages at the University of New South Wales where you can find additional papers, views and perhaps some other interesting things. Eventually I'm going to post some associated notes to this course also somewhere on these pages. So this is going to be a first course in linear algebra that means it's meant for undergraduates, first year undergraduates, or college students. If you're a very good and motivated high school student you will also be able to follow along and benefit very much. The course is designed in 50 minute lectures. So this is going to be the first lecture, and it's going to be roughly 50 minutes long. I'll break those lectures into roughly 10 minute segments for YouTube, but I also expect that I'll post the complete lecture at the University of New South Wales YouTube site. So you'll have two different possible ways of accessing the lectures, either in 10 minute blocks or in one solid block. So that's what we're going to do, and now let's begin. So what is linear algebra? Linear algebra could also be called linear algebraic geometry. That's a good description because linear algebra is really a lot about geometry. But it's geometry viewed at from an algebraic point of view. And moreover, the type of algebra that we're going to be using is of the simplest kind. Namely, it's the linear kind. Another way of describing what linear algebra is, is to say that it's the geometry of n-dimensional space. And what kind of n-dimensional space? Well, a certain affine n-dimensional space. And the linear transformations of that n-dimensional affine space. So I put those things in quotes because you're not supposed to know already what those things mean. But I think it's good to have a rough idea of where we might be headed. We're going to be talking about n-dimensional space from an affine point of view. And we're going to be talking about transformations of that space which are linear. And we're going to be working a lot with situations that look a little bit like this. We have one set of variables x1, x2, x3 representing a point in three-dimensional space or a vector in three-dimensional space. And we have another triple y1, y2, y3 representing a second point. And we have some relationship or some transformation from the x's to the y's. So in this case the y1, y2, and y3 are functions or combinations of the x's. But the combinations are of a very particular simple kind. They're only involving the x's to the first power. So there are no x's squared, there are no products of xi's. Each xi simply appears with a coefficient, which is a number. So this kind of arithmetic involved in this expression is going to be central to what linear algebra is. The applications of linear algebra are very diverse. Engineering, to economics, to physics, to graphics, computer science, of course, to mathematics, almost all branches of mathematics somehow use linear algebra, statistics, finance, robotics, chemistry. Linear algebra provides us with a very flexible language for analyzing and studying a whole wide variety of things. Because a whole wide variety of situations are ultimately n-dimensional in some way if you look at things correctly. And the simplest possible transformations of those n-dimensional space so those are the linear ones. So what are we going to do today? Today we're going to introduce affine geometry in the two-dimensional situation to start you thinking about this type of geometry. And we're going to illustrate the core problem of linear algebra, or at least one of the 
first core problems of linear algebra in this two-dimensional setting. So can I explain without going into a lot of details what affine geometry is? Well, for now what I want you to think about is that it's the geometry of parallels, where the notion of parallel is crucial, but there's no notion of perpendicular. So let's imagine that we're working in a two-dimensional plane and we have lines, say about this line here. And what we do is we suppose that we can translate that line so that it remains parallel. So we're allowed to move the line in this fashion here, always maintaining parallelism with the given line. So that's what we're able to do. We're able to identify parallelism, but we imagine that we have no notion of perpendicularity whatsoever. We might have one of these um, tools that draftsmen uh, have where they allow to slide straight edges along whatever uh, inclination they're at. All right, so what can we do? What, how can we build up a geometry if we only know parallel lines? Well, what we can do is we can start with this. What we can do is start with a line and then any line that's parallel to it, which is different from it. So we start with two parallel lines in one direction and then random some other pair of parallel lines. And that's a basic configuration that gives us a little parallelogram there that can be used to set up something much more elaborate, what I call the affine grid plane. So just starting with this combination, we can now perform the following constructions. What we're going to do is we're going to construct more parallel lines which are parallel and equally spaced to the ones that we've already started with. And how are we going to do that? Because we're not allowed to use a ruler here. We're only allowed to use our notion of parallel. So here I've taken this picture here and I've uh, transferred over here. So there's the original four lines here, 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 and here. And what we do is we look at a diagonal. So over here, the line between these two points we'll call a diagonal. I've shown it to you over here in green. Okay. Let's just look at it over here. If we look at this line, then parallel to that, there's a line through one of the corners, one of the other two corners of our parallelogram. So that line and that line are parallel to the given diagonal. And I've drawn them here. There's the original diagonal, and there's another one parallel. There's another one parallel through the other two corners of our parallelogram. What do those other diagonal lines do for us? Well, they allow us to determine some more points. Because this new diagonal line intersects one of the original blue lines right there and also right there. And this line here, similarly, intersects at a new point there and new point there. So what we can do is with those new points is we can draw lines that are parallel to the original blue lines through those new points. So let's have be specific here. So there's our off diagonal line, intersected our original line through that point. Now we construct through that point a line parallel to one of our original horizontal ones, that black line there. Similarly, we can construct this black line, and we can construct this black line and this black line. And then if we continue in this way by taking further diagonals, say that one there, or that one there, or in fact we could also go use these ones as well. We can continue this pattern to create a sequence of vertical and horizontal or roughly vertical and horizontal parallel lines. And they're all going to be equally separated. That's the beautiful aspect of this. Forming a pleasant sort of tessellation of the plane subdivided into all equal parallelograms. And that's going to be our basic sort of building block for affine geometry. The idea of the plane being subdivided into equal parallelograms, each one a translate of the starting one. So as we go through this course, it will probably be a good idea for you to copy down everything that I write and try to capture also most of the things that I say because pretty well everything that I say is reasonably important. It will also be quite good for you to try to give yourself some room to go in different directions or to try variants of the examples that I've given you. That's an important way of developing familiarity and expertise and feeling comfortable with things. Rework what I'm doing with slightly different examples. 
So if, when you create a grid plane, it doesn't have to be like this. You can make these lines be some different inclination. Also the same thing with these other lines. Okay. We're allowed to choose any family of lines to do this. The directions are somewhat arbitrary and it doesn't matter whether your grid plane looks the same as my grid plane or someone else's. The geometry that we're going to build up is going to look the same for everyone. Let me emphasize that in this setup there is no distance, so we're not assuming we have any ruler. There's no way for us to compare this distance and this distance. So we don't talk about these lines being equally spaced as these lines. We only say that these lines here themselves are equally spaced, and these lines here are equally spaced, but we do not compare this separation to this separation. There is no special point or origin in this picture, and there's no angle measurements either. What we can do, however, is to describe the relative positions of two points. For example, that point A and that point B are separated by a series of steps in the directions that we've chosen. If we go three steps in this horizontal direction, in let's say that positive direction, arbitrarily, and then, three, then two steps up in this sort of vertical direction, that describes the relationship between A and B. And we use our vector notation for that, so we say that the vector AB is, well, it's the, this pair of points, and it's encoded by this pair of numbers. The first one representing the number of steps that we take in one of the directions, and the second, how many steps we go in the other direction. Now, because this relative position here is the same as this relative position, C to D is also three steps over and two steps up. These two vectors, C, D, and A, B, are considered to be the same. And we would give them a name, typically something like V with a little arrow on top to call them vectors. How about, say, between A and C? To get from A to C, we go also in this direction one step, but in the negative direction from the previous one. So we'll indicate that with a negative one, and then up two. So the vector AC is minus one, two. And that's the same as the vector BD, minus one, up two. Let's call that vector W. In general, a vector is a relationship between any two points of our grid plane, and it's encoded by a pair of numbers x, y in round brackets. And the x means the number of horizontal steps that you're taking, where horizontal is just your first line. And y is the number of vertical steps you're taking, in other words, the number of steps along the second family of lines. And to make sense of this, each of these lines has to have a, a direction which is the, sort of the positive direction. So we have to choose for each of the lines a uh, distinguished positive direction to begin with. So this is our connection between geometry and algebra. Geometrically, we have a vector or a directed line segment. Algebraically, we have an ordered pair of numbers. Both are important ways of thinking about the same physical object or the same mathematical object. And the interplay between the geometry and the algebra is one of the key pleasant aspects of the subject and also what makes the subject so powerful. Now a natural question you may have is, do we only consider points which are on the intersections of our families of lines? Or do the vectors that we're considering always have to have integer values? Well that would be too limiting and so we want to also include other points. And here's how we do it. We make the observation that, the important observation, that we can subdivide any segment into n equal pieces. All right. This is an idea that goes back to the ancient Greeks. So let me illustrate it with this segment between this point A and this point B. Suppose I want to divide that into three equal pieces and I don't have a ruler. I only have a straight edge and the notion of parallel. What am I going to do? Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to use this other line in a completely different direction, and I'm going to use the fact that I can find three equally spaced points, or three equally, four equally spaced lines, on that line. So here, these points here are then going to be connected to the points on AB via parallel lines. We start with this point here, and we draw that line 
between it and B. And then through each of these two points, we draw other lines parallel to the first one. That's going to divide the segment AB into three equal pieces. And we can equally divide AB into any number of equal pieces in this way. So over here, for example, I've used the same idea to subdivide CD into three equal pieces. And once we've got these equal pieces, well, then we can draw parallel lines through them to refine our, our grid. Or these line points here, we can draw parallel lines through them to subdivide our grid. So now we're having, uh, instead of uh, one line from here to here, we have three lines from here to here. And we can do that through, for, throughout the, the region. So we can subdivide or refine our grid, and that allows us to talk about vectors also between points which weren't on our original grid, but which are on some refinement of it. So, for example, if we look at this point here and this point here, then you can check that the vector that I've called W here in red, that vector can be expressed as 8 thirds, 10 thirds, in terms of how far we go over in this direction and then how far we go up in this direction. In this way, we can consider vectors whose coefficients are arbitrary rational numbers. And I remind you that a rational number is an expression of form A over B, where A and B are integers and B is not equal to zero, and where we have the important rule for equality, that A over B equals C over D, precisely when A, D minus B, C equals zero. In other words, something like two-thirds is the same as four-sixths, because two times six is equal to four times three. It's a rational number. So our vectors can actually have rational number entries. And for now, at least, we're not going to consider any other kind of numbers. We're going to be working with linear algebra, at least for the first little while, purely in terms of the natural framework for arithmetic, which is the rational number system. The notion of a vector is a very flexible and important one. One of the important aspects of it is that there are two arithmetical operations that we can do with vectors. We can form multiples of a vector and we can add vectors. So let me explain how that works. So here's a, another grid plane, an affine grid plane, and I've drawn all kinds of vectors here. First of all, I've drawn a little vector in one of the directions of the lines. I've called it, say, E1. So there's E1, and this is also the, exactly the same vector. This is also the same vector because the separation between these two points is exactly the same as the separation between these two points. Here's a vector E2, which is a basis vector in the other uh, direction. And here's another copy of E2. Now, other vectors can be expressed as combinations of E1 and E2, and that's one of the key points that we need to understand. So let's look at some other vectors. Here's the vector V, going from this point to this point. And that vector V is also the same as that vector V there. Also the same as that vector V there. We can take that vector V and we can multiply it by a scalar or by a number. So for example, here's 2V. It means that we take this vector and we add to it another copy of itself. V plus V makes 2V. Here's 3V. From here to here, that vector is 3V. It's three times as long as V in the same direction as V. Arithmetically, the vector v is 1 in this direction and 2 in this direction, so it's given by the pair 1, 2. So, for example, minus v, which would be this one here, is minus 1, minus 2. It's given by minus the first direction, minus 2 times the second direction. The other multiples, say 2v, it's over 2, up 4. That's given by 2, 4, and you see conveniently that that's exactly what you get by taking these coefficients and multiplying them by 2. The vector 3v is over 3 and up 6, so it's the vector 3, 6, and that is indeed, again, just 3 times the vector v. So our geometrical understanding of multiplying or scaling a vector 
coincides with the natural arithmetical notion of simply multiplying the entries by the corresponding number. In exactly this kind of similar way, we can add two vectors. So let's now introduce another vector, say w, there's w. And it's the vector 3, 1. And there's another copy of w down here. There's another copy of w up there. So suppose we take this vector v and this vector w, and we want to add them. So there's v and there's w. How would we add those two vectors? Well, what we do is we put them together so that one follows the other. So the relevant picture is up here. So there's a copy of v, and there's a copy of w, and now they're together in the sense that we go along one, and then when we finish with that one, then we immediately go along the other vector. So there's v, and there's w, so this combined trip gives us the corresponding vector v plus w. So this red one is what we call v plus w. In general, v plus w is obtained by moving the tail of w, namely that, the bottom part of it, onto the head of v. So there's the head of v. So we move v wherever it might be. So it's there. And we take w and we move it so that its tail is on the head of v. And then the resulting vector is v plus w. And algebraically, that simply corresponds to adding the first components and adding the second components. And let me also remark that in terms of the basis vectors, in terms of these sort of fundamental vectors that we're calling E1 and E2 here, that make up the grid themselves, we can write now a vector, V, say, as a combination of these two. So when we say that the vector V is 1, 2, what did that mean? It meant that it's 1 in this direction and 2 in this direction. Well, that simply means that it's the vector E1 plus 2 times the vector E2. So this is another way of describing the vector v instead of coordinates like that. Similarly, the vector w, which we wrote before as 3, 1, can be expressed in terms of the basis vectors e1 and e2 as 3, e1 plus e2. All right, now I suppose that you'll have absorbed those ideas. And now we move on to something a little bit more complicated when we consider not just one affine plane, but two different affine planes. So we're going to imagine that we have two people around. One's called Bob, Bob is blue, and Rachel, who is red. And Bob has created an affine grid plane, these blue lines in these directions and in these directions. The basis vectors for Bob's grid are these vectors E1 and E2. So there's E1, for example, in the horizontal direction, and there's E2 in roughly in the vertical direction. Now, also you can see a red grid plane. This is Rachel's grid plane, and here are the red lines. That's one family, and another family like this. And where are her basis vectors? Well, one's F1 in this direction, another is F2 that looks like this. And for example, from here to here, that's F1. Of course, that's the same vector as, as from here to here, or from here to here, or from here to here. And the other one, F2, from here to here, which is the same as from here to here, or from here to here. Now, you can see that they're, they're different sizes, and each one of them, Bob and Rachel, are going to look at this plane in a different way. If we have two points, say that's this point A and this point B, then Bob and Rachel are going to describe the vector between these two points in two different ways. How is Bob going to describe this vector? Well, he's going to say, all right, in my point of view, I've got to go over one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then I've got to go up one, two, three, four. So he's going to say that the vector AB is 7 times his vector E1, giving us, getting us there, plus 4 times the vector E2. Or in other words, he's going to write it as the, the pair 7, 4, representing 7 steps in this direction, 4 steps in this direction. So that's Bob's description of the vector AB, and I've put B here for Bob. This B is different from the point B. What about Rachel? Well, 
A and B are also on her grid. So she also thinks this is not too hard to describe. To get from here to here in her grid, she would say, I go one, two steps in this direction, and then one step in this direction. Her steps are bigger than Bob's. So she's gone two F1 steps, F1, F1, plus one F2. So she would describe that same vector by the coordinates two, one. So we'll put a little R here for Rachel, telling us that this is Rachel's interpretation of what this vector AB is. So we have two different observers with two different frameworks or coordinate systems. And now we're interested in comparing how does one compare to the other. This is a very important problem in linear algebra. And it's also, you can see, an important problem in applications. If you're designing a computer game or some, doing some graphics and you have two different observers or people, you want to be able to compare how their two perspectives look. All right, so the key to understanding the relationship between these two is to observe that you can express Rachel's basis vectors pretty simply in terms of Bob's. Okay, why is that? Well, here is uh, F1. Okay, from here, there's Rachel's F1 vector. And this can be described by Bob as the vector 3, 1. In other words, F1 is 3 times E1 plus E2. It's three of these guys followed by one of these. And similarly, F2, which is from here to here, that's described by Bob as going 1 and then 2. So F2 is equal to E1 plus 2 times E2. And this is the critical formula that allows us to go back and forth between Bob's system and Rachel's system. So let's see how that works. All right, so here's the formula that we've just established between the F's and the E's. So this expresses Rachel's basis vectors in terms of Bob's. It means that we can go from Rachel's coordinates to Bob's coordinates in the following way. So suppose we're interested in the vector 2, 1, which was Rachel's description of our vector a, b that we started with. 2, 1 in Rachel's framework means 2 times f1 plus f2. But now we know what f1 and f2 are, thanks to this, in terms of the e's. So we can replace the f1 and the f2 by 3e1 plus e2 and by e1 plus 2e2. So now we have linear combinations of e1s and e2s. We can bring them together, get all the e1s together. There's seven e1s all together because there's two times three of them here and one of them here. And get all the e2s together. There's two of them here and another two of them there, four e2. And that tells us that we're talking about the vector seven, four in Bob's coordinates. So this agrees with what we did up here. It shows us how to go from two, one, in Rachel's system to 7, 4 in Bob's system. And here we've done the same thing more generally. This is something we're going to be doing a lot of in linear algebra. We figure out what happens in some special case and then we scratch our heads and say, what's really going on here in general? Can we write this not just with numbers but with arbitrary coefficients? And that's not just to make a headache for ourselves. We do that because it usually gives us more insight into what's going on. So let's see how that works. So instead of talking about the vector 2, 1, I'm now going to talk about the vector x1, x2 in Rachel's system. What are x1 and x2? You should think of them as simply arbitrary numbers. They're, they're numbers that we haven't decided upon. We do, we're just giving them some names. We're calling them x1, x2. So exactly parallel to what we did here, this means that we're talking about x1 times f1, F1 is our first basis vector, plus x2 times the second basis vector, F2. And just as we did up here, we can replace the F1 by this and the F2 by this. And then we do exactly the same thing. We now combine all the E1s. How many E1s are there all together? There are three times x1 of them here. We're still just treating x1 as a number, but an unknown number or variable plus x2 of them over here. So altogether, 3x1 plus x2 times e1. 
And how many E2s are there? Well, there's X1 of them from here and two times X2 of them there. So X1 plus two X2. And that's in Bob's system, the vector whose coordinates are three X1 plus X2 comma X1 plus two X2. That's in Bob's system. And let's give those coefficients another pair of names. Let's call them Y1 and Y2. So X1 and X2 are Rachel's coordinates for a given vector, and Bob's coordinates for that same vector are Y1, Y2. So we've got a relationship now between the X's and the Y's. We'll call this double star. So I've rewritten that equation double star. 3X1 plus X2, that's what we called Y1, and X1 plus 2X2 is equal to Y2. And we're going to have a good look at this pair of equations. We're going to call this equation 1 and this equation 2. And what this is, is a relationship between two variables x1, x2, and another pair of variables y1 and y2. In fact, it's giving us y1 and y2 in terms of x1 and x2. So if we know x1 and x2, we can quickly solve for what y1 and y2 are. And moreover, this relationship is a linear one, in that, in terms of x1 and x2, there are no powers of x1 or x2 here. There are no products of x1, x2. It's only something times x1 plus something times x2. That's a linear expression in x1 and x2, both of those equations. And now we come to the main problem, or one of the main problems, of linear algebra is to take a pair of equations like this and to find x1 and x2 in terms of y1 and y2. In other words, to invert this. So how do we actually do that? Well, let's perform some basic high school type manipulations. We're going to combine these two equations. We're going to take the equation number one and we're going to subtract three times equation number two. And we're going to do that in order to get rid of the x1s. So we're going to take this minus 3 times this. So the number of x1s is 0 because 3x1 minus 3x1, that's 0x1. And if we take x2 and we subtract 3 times this, we're going to get minus 5x2. That's on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, we have y1 minus 3y2. This is now a new equation, which conveniently does not have any x1s in it. It only has an x2 in it, so we can solve for x2 by dividing by negative 5. We get that x2 is minus 1 fifth of y1 plus 3 fifths of y2. The minus 3 divided by minus 5 is the same as plus 3 fifths. So now we have x2 in terms of y1 and y2. We still need to get x1 in terms of y1 and y2. So what we do is we substitute this into one of the equations. It doesn't matter which one we use. We're going to get the same answer. So let's substitute it into equation 2. So we take equation 2, x1 plus 2, and we replace x2 with this expression. And it still equals y2. Now here's an equation that only has x1 in it. So if we bring all the y's to the other side, we get x1 equals 2 fifths y1 minus 1 fifths y2, and we've solved our basic problem. We've now found x1 and x2 in terms of y1 and y2. Let's have a good look at exactly what form this takes. So to summarize what we just did, we started with this pair of equations with y1 and y2 expressed in terms of x1 and x2, and we manipulated those two equations to find x1 and x2 in terms of the y's. And we started with an equation that was linear in x1 and x2, and lo and behold, what we output is something that's also linear. So x1 and x2 are as functions of y1 and y2, also given by linear combinations. There's no y1 squareds or y2s or products of y1s times y2s. Input linear, transform, the answer is also linear. It's going to be a key feature of what happens. So we've just solved our fundamental problem in this special case, which is good, but it's not quite as good as understanding how it goes in general. So let's have a look at the general situation in 
dimensions one and then two. We haven't talked about one dimensions. What does that mean? Well, it means simply that instead of having two x's and two y variables, we only have one x variable and we only have one y variable. So the situation is very simple. Maybe you think it's too simple. Our starting equation is some relation, a linear relation between x1 and y1, where y1 is expressed in terms of x1. So a times x1 equals y1. And now we want to solve for x1. Well, I think we all know what to do. We just divide this equation by a and get x, x1 equals 1 over a, y1. So that's the, the main problem of linear algebra in one dimension. It's pretty simple. But we have to just be a little bit aware, maybe we have to be a lot aware, that it only works if this a is non-zero. That's going to be an important theme for us in higher dimensions. It's very simple in this situation, but let's keep in mind that this inversion only works when that denominator is non-zero. All right, now let's tackle the general case in two dimensions. So we're going to do exactly what we did before, but we're going to do it in general. So we're going to start with two equations connecting x1 and x2 to y1 and y2. So we suppose that we've got y1 and y2 expressed as linear combinations of x1 and x2. a times x1 plus bx2 equals y1, and cx1 plus dx2 equals y2. And what are a, b, c, and d? They are simply unknown numbers. We just treat them as numbers whose values we don't really know. So we have to do the arithmetic not knowing what a, b, c, and d are. We'll call this equation 1, we call this equation 2, and now we do something that is rather clever. What we do is we take a combination of these two equations. The first combination is we're going to take a times equation 2, and we're going to subtract c times equation 1. What are a and c? Well, they're just these unknown numbers, these variable numbers. So what happens when we take a times this equation and we subtract c times this equation? Well, the main thing that happens is that the x1s disappear. We get 0x1. We get a times dx2 minus b times c x2. So we get AD minus BCX2. And on the right hand side we get A times this minus C times this. So AY2 minus CY1. And there's an equation that we can already solve for X2. But before we do that, let's do the same thing to find X1. So now what we're going to do is we're going to take D times equation 1 and subtract B times equation 2. So d times this equation, subtract b times this equation. What now happens? Well now d times this minus b times this, the x2s are going to disappear, and we're going to have zero x2s. Notice that I still put a zero here, just to keep the proper placeholder in, in view. We're going to have a times d x1, subtract b times c x1, giving us that on the left hand side. And on the right hand side, d times this minus b times this. There. All right, we're pretty well done. Now we just divide by this ad minus bc because it's the same coefficient in both equations. We divide by that and we find that x1 equals, so that's this equation, x1 equals d times y1 divided by this thing. Let's call this thing delta. It's a Greek letter. We're just going to introduce that because it's a little bit shorter than writing AD minus BC. So that's delta. So we get X1 equals D over delta times Y1 minus B over delta times Y2. And similarly from this equation, X2 equals A over delta uh, Y2, let's do the, the Y1 first, minus C divided by delta times Y1. So we put the Y1 first, plus A over delta times Y2. Yeah, we've done it. We've done the general problem in two dimensions. So you can check that what we did earlier up here is just a special case of this when A, B, C, D happen to have values 3, 1, 1, 2. Well, maybe we can go home now. That's it for linear algebra. We've just solved the main problem. Well, not quite. Uh, 
we do need to make a few uh, observations. First, we need to ensure that this denominator, delta, down here, is not equal to zero. That's going to be an important thing. And secondly, this is only in two dimensions. What happens in three dimensions? Going from one dimension to two dimensions was already a little bit more complicated. And it will turn out that in three dimensions it's more complicated and as we go up in dimensions this problem gets more and more complicated. So we've done well. We've established the fundamental formula for the basic problem of linear algebra in two dimensions. We've also found that there's some interesting object that occurs that this quantity delta, which we called AD minus BC, first of all, it needs to be non-zero. We ask what happens if it is zero. And we can also ask, what does that actually mean? In terms of Bob and Rachel's original problem involving the grid plane, what is the geometrical content, if any, of this number? And how do we generalize what we did to three dimensions? That's going to keep us going for a little while. To get a start on that, here's a little exercise. So our first exercise, exercise 1.1, so it's the first exercise in, in lecture one. Take this system, which has three equations connecting x1, x2, x3 to y1, y2, y3, and find the x's in terms of the y's. This is a kind of a, a baby situation because there is not so many uh, non-zero coefficients, but it's a start. And here are a few more exercises. Exercise 1.2. Create your own affine grid plane and then draw vectors that correspond to 1, 2, minus 2, 3, 0, 4. And then find these various combinations V plus U, V plus W, V plus U plus W, where we add those two first. V plus U plus W, where we add those. These, of course, should be the same. 3v minus u, v minus u, w minus v, 2v plus u minus w. And you can find all of these vectors both geometrically and algebraically. In this exercise, I ask you to essentially do again what we've already done. Solve for the x1 and x2 in terms of y1 and y2. Three different cases. And in this exercise, solve for x1 and x2, where in this case, the right-hand side, instead of having y1 and y2, there are particular numbers involved. So it's actually somewhat easier than this one, but it's just a different variant. All right, so that's our first lecture completed. Please study it carefully. Make sure that you understand everything in it. Okay? In mathematics, especially in this course, you really want to understand everything that I do. Next time, we are going to talk about the plane again, the affine plane, and we're going to discuss vectors and geometry from a vector point of view. I hope you'll join me for that. I'm Norman Walberger. Thanks for listening.